I wanted to begin by acknowledging that um, all the lands that we're going to be speaking about and doing this virtual tour on are the historic homeland of the Mountain Maidu people. And uh, in Sierra Valley, also the historic homeland of the Washoe uh, tribe. And um, just wanted to honor that and um, thankful to be um, walking in their footsteps and working with them in many cases to, to regain their homeland and their traditional practices. So, so thank you. Um, so birding in the Feather River region. Um, I, I sincerely regret that I can't be with you in person. Uh, there's so many of you. I had a chance a couple days ago to see the advance uh, registration list. And uh, so many of you are cherished friends and colleagues and partners. And uh, in so many cases, we've, we've toured, we've birded together, we've toured lands together. And in many cases, our endeavors together, um, the discovering of those places, the celebrating of those places, and your generous um, contributions to our conservation work have led to the conservation of those places. So I am I'm forever grateful for that. And um, it's truly some of the highlights of my life, the time I've spent on the land with you all. So, um, but this, this will be fun, even though I'd rather be in a canoe or on, on the land with you. Um, but uh, it, it's great to be with you virtually at least. And this is a picture of me with my son and daughter birding in the Sierra Valley wetlands. And um, we're spying a kind of a duck with a blue bill, a suspiciously blue bill, the ruddy duck. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have lots of bird slides by the way. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but um, I am, I am gonna have my binoculars. Some of my slides are obscure. So you might need your binoculars to look at your screen to actually identify some of the birds. And if you have a notebook or a piece of paper handy, what I'm gonna do on each bird slide is I'm going to give you four or five seconds before I identify the bird. In fact, I'll give you four or five seconds and then because usually, you know, with a live group, we'd ask, you know, verbally if someone knew who it was and people would offer their guesses and stuff. But so I'll give you four or five seconds, then I'll name a couple key field identification marks of the species. And then I'll, I'll name it after about six or seven seconds. So I just want to let you know uh, that, you know, you can write it in the chat if you want. There's so many people on the call, it's probably hard to monitor the chat. But um, that's kind of going to be the bird scenario. Um, in terms of uh, my own, some of my own roots and wings, um, the, I, I, was, I was very blessed to have parents uh, to, to, well, first of all, to be born in the Feather River watershed. I was born in Portola along uh, in the old Western Pacific Railroad Hospital along the Middle Fork of the Feather River. And uh, this is a slide of my mom on the left in the, um, in the 70s, probably around 1974, I would guess, with uh, Smith Peak in the background and um, in Sierra Valley, in what is now the Sierra Valley Preserve. And we were probably out getting worms for fish fishing season that day, but you can see I have my first pair of binoculars there. And we were checking out uh, the birds, mostly waterfowl probably. And there's another slide of me in Sierra Valley, um, probably same year uh, or maybe or maybe a little younger uh, hunting I one of the I grew up doing a lot of waterfowl hunting in Sierra Valley and other places and it was one of my introductions to nature um, and and then that you know that uh, that legacy of uh, of sharing nature with my own kids on the left. That's uh, my own two kids it passed on from my parents. That's my dad on the right uh, on a Christmas bird count in Sierra Valley. And then uh, I'm obviously not giving very good instruction to my son on the left there. He's, he's got his binoculars backwards, but he, he's a pretty good birder now. So that my kids are now 18 and 14. But when you, when you grow up in relationship to land, um, it becomes part of who you are. And um, 
as I was going to graduate school, college and graduate school, I just began to, friends and I began to see changes in the Feather River region that cumulatively were having, uh, starting to have quite an impact. Um, uh, golf resorts and, and sort of bedroom commuter, commuter development, uh, especially in Eastern Plumas County was really having an impact. And we, we tried um, participating in the land use process in other ways, but we decided the best way to try to make a difference in the future of our watershed with a real motivation of, uh, of ensuring that the same experiences that I had growing up and my kids have been able to have will be available um, for generations to come. So we started the Feather River Land Trust. Um, and Katie gave a great introduction to the Land Trust and I'm really happy to still be uh, doing a lot of work with Feather River Land Trust in my consulting capacity. Uh, it's one of, uh, it's my favorite region and um, still a core of my heart. And so are these guys um, spending a lot of time raising these kids. So, um, so what makes the Feather River region uh, unique? Um, partly, this is a map of the Feather River watershed you see here, and it's the largest watershed in the Sierra, uh, over 2.3 million acres. It's larger than Yellowstone National Park. And it's really uniquely located at the triple intersection of the Sierra Nevada on the, in the south, the Cascade region to the north, Cascade uh, mountain range. You can see some of the volcanoes, Mount La uh, Lassen Peak and Bernie Mountain here. Mount Shasta just off the map. And then the Great Basin uh, to the east and then the Sierra Foothills and Central Valley to the west. But it's at a real um, geologic uh, intersection point of, of granite, uh, a volcanic driven geology, uh, huge rain shadow in the Great Basin side of the watersheds. And it's, it's the only watershed in the Sierra that actually drains through the Sierra Crest. There's a lot of land east of the Sierra Crest that drains to the west through the Sierra Crest. That's partly why it's so big. But that, that melting pot of geology, ecoregions, and species make it a very biodiverse place, including for our, uh, for lucky us, for birds. Um, so the, the, the region stretches from the uh, granite dominated uh, Sierra in the south with its glaciated, you can see a couple glaciated lakes down here, Lower Sardine and Upper Sardine Lake. And then uh, in the north, you have the Cascades. This is Mount Lassen from Mountain Me uh, from Lassen Peak. I always say it wrong, from Mountain Meadows. And then it stretches from the west, the oak woodlands of the western foothills of the watershed to the the real um, sage scrub dominated uh, uh, Great Basin-esque eastern side of the watershed. And this is on the east side of Sierra Valley, that slide. Um, there also are a lot of, um, you can see these big intermountain valleys, Sierra Valley, Indian Valley, Genesee Valley, American Valley, big meadows at Lake Almanor. Uh, that are really unique in the Sierra. The Sierra is, the rest of the Sierra is, uh, doesn't have these big valleys. There are some exceptions like Yosemite Valley, but the, the Northern Sierra, Feather River Watershed is very unique in, in its large valleys. And those large valleys support abundant wetlands at, like in Sierra Valley and amazing valleys and riparian areas on the right, that's Genesee. Uh, there's volcanic cliffs that uh, <clears throat> support Canyon wrens, rock wrens, nesting falcons, large both natural and uh, man-made reservoirs uh, and lakes. Amazing montane meadows, and these are uh, cotton sedge uh, in, in Sierra Valley. Amazing riparian areas, very diverse. This is uh, cottonwood dominated riparian coming down the North Fork of the Feather near Chester. And, uh, and, and wetlands, uh, amazing wetlands, especially um, in, uh, in Sierra Valley and in the Almanor Basin area and throughout the watershed really, but the largest ones are in those places. And then there's some places like this, this is uh, Genesee Valley and the, the, all the bottom lands you see in this slide are owned by the Feather River Land Trust. It's the Hart K Ranch. And there's some properties where 
so many of those habitats I mentioned all come together in one place. You can see the river, in, which is Indian Creek flowing through the bottom of Genesee Valley. You can see the, the lush riparian areas dominated by large cottonwoods on the edges. Oak woodlands on the left, um, mixed conifer forest on the right, and uh, just a very amazing diverse place. And there's a lot of places like that in the watershed. So in addition to where the, where the Feather River watershed is located with that conjunction of ecoregions, four ecoregions, when we're considering, uh, and that, that drives a lot of the bird diversity and biodiversity, I wanted to hit on timing. Uh, I'm gonna be focused on the period we're in now, um, April, start, you know, tomorrow starting April into mid-May. Um, Cause a lot of, you know, birding is very dependent on when you do the birding. And if, and if you want to see the maximum number of species, uh, timing's very important. So just to give you a feel for where we're at, we're coming to the end of the period, February through March, where for the, the vast majority of wintering species in the Feather River watershed depart. And uh, those are the species like Phrygianus hawks, rough-legged hawks, and a lot of the waterfowl species that overwintered. They're taking off and, and mostly heading north um, to their breeding grounds. We're getting, we've been getting uh, early arrivals of migratory breeding species uh, kicked off by sandhill cranes, which gosh, some of them arrived in January this year because the weather's been so mild. But some of the other early migrants are uh, include swallow species, waterfowl, some hummingbirds and hawks uh, often uh, get a jump on things. And then some, some early passage migrants, passage means they're passing through the Feather River watershed on their way further north, are, have also been passing through mostly in March. Uh, shorebirds and waterfowl are two examples of that. And the, we're at a really exciting time right now um, in that, you know, if, if you've been out in the woods, if you've been in the Feather River watershed lately and you've been out in the woods, you've probably noticed it's kind of quiet, um, kind of like the calm before the storm. Uh, there's, there's some birds that are, on the move and showing up like American robins have been on the move and sparrow and some sparrows. But um, it's, it's really a really special time because the, the, all the habitats, uh, they're greening up, they're preparing themselves to greet uh, their long lost, their friends, their friends who the, the birds that, that breed in our region. Uh, so Starting now and through mid-May, nearly all of the migratory breeding birds in the Feather River region uh, arrive. And, the, and, and that's a whole suite of species, but including warblers and vireos and tanagers and um, flycatcher sparrows, wrens, blackbirds, wading birds, hawks. And then also at the same time, um, a, a, a great number of passage migrants are passing through our region. So, it's a really exciting time. I, I encourage you to get out with your, I know we have a variety of, um, of ages and, and sort of birding skill on this call. There's some kids on this call, but now's the time. Uh, kids, if you're coming of, if, if you've never birded before and if you're, um, if you're tempted to get out there, man, April is the time, especially like mid-April through late April because you have a combination of all the breeding species arriving and there's all these migratory species coming through like shorebirds and warblers and waterfowl and all of the above. Um, and then as we, as we sort of move past that period into mid-May and June, the, the late straggler migratory species, you might call them, arrive. Uh, species like willow flycatcher, Pacific slope flycatcher, and Swainson's thrush are some of the later, most of those are late May into early June. And then uh, believe it or not, in June, some of the long distance migrants that came through in March and early April are already headed back. Um, species like Rufus hummingbird, which uh, breeds up in the Pacific Northwest, and some of the shorebirds that breed up in Alaska and in the, in the, in the Arctic, uh, uh, in the subarctic, um, are also moving through and coming back down. So it's a real busy time, but we're gonna be focused on the April, May into June time period. So, um, an overview of birding hotspots. Um, uh, what we're going to be able to cover today, uh, we have limited time. We're going to focus on Sierra Valley. I looked at a lot of your comments and there was a lot of interest in Sierra Valley. 
and in Lake Almanor. Had intended to talk about the Hart K Ranch and, and uh, American Valley Quincy as well, but would have to have a two hour presentation for that. Uh, but that's where we're gonna focus on. And uh, starting in Sierra Valley, uh, this is a, a, a map of the Sierra Valley region generally. Sierra Valley is over here on uh, in the eastern portion of the Feather River region. Um, you can see these lands that are in the light green are lands that have been conserved by Feather River Land Trust and its partners. And you can see there's a, a quite a conservation impact um, has been occurring. There's been uh, about uh, close to um, 40 to 50,000 acres of land all told between Red Clover Valley along uh, uh, Long Valley here and Sierra Valley. So uh, it's been quite a, quite a run. And then a lot of you have been key in that conservation effort. So thank you for helping to put all that green on the map. Um, and you can see the Sierra Valley wetlands are kind of marked in, in this blue shading in the middle part of Sierra Valley. So um, Sierra Valley, some highlights of Sierra Valley. Uh, I'd like to, uh, well, it's, you, you, I guess, you know, it's such a legacy that we uh, lead. And like I mentioned, I cherish the times I've spent with all of you in the Valley. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Bill Harnack, who's in this slide, um, a botanist who played such a formative and important role um, with the land trust. Uh, who passed away last year, and I'll, I'll always cherish being in the field with Bill and his wife Nancy. Um, some highlights of Sierra Valley and the Sierra Valley Basin it's in is uh, 280 bird species have been identified in the Sierra Valley Basin. Sierra Valley supports the largest wetland complex in the Sierra Nevada, uh, 200 or uh, 20,000 acres of wetlands, some of which you see right behind us in the slide. Some places I'll highlight are, uh, are the Sierra Valley Preserve, which is owned by the Land Trust, Marble Hot Springs Road, and Steel Bridge, which is arguably the most well-known birding area in the Feather River region, and then Harriet Lane. So let's get into the birds. I know, I know you came for the birds, and I've been uh, showing you maps and giving you a lot of background and context, but it's time to get into the birds. So get your field notebooks ready or a piece of paper because we're going to jump right into um, bird species. And I want to look here to make sure I'm not too far behind. Uh, where are we at? OK. All right, we're not too far behind on the time. OK, so first species. Again, I'm going to give you four or five seconds. This, I, one hint on these is that these are taller than some of the kids on the call. Here is another shot. You got it? Sandhill crane. I bet a lot of you got that one. One of our most charismatic and large species, the tallest definitely in the entire Feather River region. And um, they're early arrivals. You can tell there's snow falling in this one. These, the baby chicks of sandhill cranes are usually called colts. So this pair has two colts that are probably oh, maybe uh, three weeks past hatching, and they're out feeding with mom and dad. Um, the C um, Sierra Valley and the Feather River region generally is very significant for greater sandhill cranes, which are a threatened, a state threatened species in California. There's estimated to be about 250 pairs of sandhill cranes in the entire state. And about 50 of those pairs, 40 to 50, I've, I've been on almost every ranch in the last few years, and I'd estimate 50 pairs, uh, more than we previously thought, uh, breed in Sierra Valley. So about a fifth of the state's entire population. And then if you take the rest of the Feather River watershed, there's probably about 50 other pairs in the whole rest of the Feather River watershed. So probably around 100 pairs, so very significant watershed for cranes. All right, next species. Get that notebook out. This one, its name describes itself. Now there's two of them there. That yellow head. Some people I've birded with have said, what is that yellow headed blackbird? And they would be right when they said it that way because it is the yellow headed blackbird. This is a male yellow headed blackbird. An amazingly strikingly vis visually striking and also 
has an amazing voice that sounds very electric. I, if there were people here like could talk, if I could hear you, you would probably goad me into uh, doing impressions of birds. Maybe once I get warmed up, I'll do a few bird impressions. Um, here we have the, the kindred red wing blackbird with its red and um, beautiful red wing with mostly yellow and orangish dominated underwing colors, underwing coverts. And then we have another uh, yellow headed male blackbird. And here are the females, which often are um, confuse a lot of people, especially the red wing blackbird female looks very little like the male, very streaked on the breast. Had the, the bill is very sharp and long, similar. They, interestingly, if you get good light, you can often see they do have a little red reddish rusty patch on their shoulder. And then you have the female yellow-headed blackbird on the right, which has yellow on the head, just not nearly as extensively as the male. Yeah, um, but there's the, the females. Okay, another um, char very characteristic Sierra Valley bird. One of the largest breeding colonies in the state of California of this species is in Sierra Valley. Uh, this is one that is not quite in its breeding plumage, as I'll show shortly here. This is the same species in its breeding plumage, and it has this characteristic white lining around its eye coming up to the bill in the, into the sear area for those birders. All right, have you guessed? I don't, I don't think it's very well named, but it does have white on the face. It's the white-faced ibis. And, and there's estimated to be about um, anywhere from a thousand to two thousand breeding pairs in Sierra Valley of the species. So it's a very important area. Switching gears to a very little, one of the littlest breeding bird species in the Sierra Valley wetlands. And it's singing away on a, uh, on a barbed wire fence. You got it. It lives in the marsh. It cocks its tail like its brethren. It's a marsh wren. And on the opposite side of the size and weight spectrum, this uh, uh, look at those, those beaks that can hold more than its belican. And these uh, are coming over from Pyramid Lake, which is the, where the biggest breeding colony of this species exists in North America. They come on over to Sierra Valley to dine on catfish and carp mostly. Um, and these are the American white pelicans. Uh, most of the pelicans that come over to Sierra Valley don't have a bump on their nose. The breeding pelicans have a, a, a horn, they call it, on their nose. The non-breeding ones don't. So this is kind of unusual to see a breeding one, probably just finished breeding and came over for a snack. All right, there are about 12 species of waterfowl, that is ducks and geese, that breed in the Sierra Valley wetlands. So we're going to look at some of these. I already gave this one away with its suspiciously light blue bill, as if someone colored it with a, you know, painted on it with a paintbrush. That's the male ruddy duck. Uh, and then on the right here, this is a sort of a trick question. There's two species here. This is a female and this is a male. All right, your time is up. This is the, on the right, we have the um, northern pintail male. And on the left, we have a female mallard. All right, now we have two more, a certain class of duck, the smallest kind of duck, except for ruddy ducks in Sierra Valley. Um, let's see, well, there, are, there are hints in their, um, in their colors. The, look at the color on the right and uh, tell me what you think it is. And then not only does this one on the left have green on its head, it has green in its wing. I should have put a flying one. Can you teal what they are? We have green wing teal and cinnamon teal pair, female on the left, male on the right. All right. These, in addition to the cinnamon teal, are uh, two of the three most common breeding duck species in Sierra Valley. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, I think we, you know, we, whether it's we take for granted, um, I know I'm taking a long time here. <laughs> I got to start speeding up. Uh, I, won't, I won't pause as long for the identifications. 
we don't always, we sometimes take them for granted. We have a beautiful mallard male on the left and a beautiful gadwall male on the right. And then lastly, in terms of the duck species of Sierra Valley, this is the least common breeding duck, the uh, one, a, a actual special status uh, species, of special concern in California, the redhead, males with the red head and the females uh, more brown. A couple falcon species nest on the edge of Sierra Valley in the, um, in the volcanic cliffs that we saw earlier. Uh, different facial patterns. Look for the dark armpit on the prairie falcon and then the peregrine falcon. And they love, especially the peregrine loves eating all those duck species I just showed you. They dive bomb them, fastest bird in the world. They go about half mile in the air and just dive bomb them. Into some more wetland species here. I got to speed it up a little bit. This is the look at that black and white wing pattern. It is the willet. Uh, they nest often at the base of sage on the edge of wetlands, interestingly. There's another willet. All right, I'll do, I don't think Art Hall's on the call, but the, the willet says its name when it calls. It gives a distress call and they go, wee wee willet, wee wee willet. Ah, the, the next two species are two of the longest distance migrants to Sierra Valley. This is, I'm giving you a chance. It's a hawk that migrates all the way from Argentina to breed in Sierra Valley. It's the, it's the Swainson's hawk. Similarly, these species winter in uh, saline lakes in Patagonia uh, in Southern South America. And this is the same species, uh, the Wilson's phalarope. They have reverse polyandry. This is actually a female, and this is the male. The female is much more uh, inortly, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, beautifully decorated. And um, interestingly, the females, uh, they compete, they fight each other for males, lay their eggs, and then the males incubate the eggs. So it's a reverse. Um, uh, sex roles, reverse gender roles. There's some more Wilson's phalaropes. Here we have, staying as still as it can, a, a bittern, American bittern in the Sierra Valley wetlands. There are two wetland nesting raptor species in Sierra Valley, the short-eared owl shown here, and this is the northern harrier, female on the left, male on the right. And then a ground nesting raptor species as well, which usually chooses uh, either ground squirrel, usually California ground squirrel or uh, American badger burrows. And they are found, we have found them on the Sierra Valley Preserve and in other places in Sierra Valley. You can see this one is at its burrow. Uh, they, they excavate the burrows that the, the badgers and squirrels have started. A lot of species, you know, in Sierra Valley, it's not just about the wetlands. Um, sage thrasher here is a, is a lot of people come to Sierra Valley to see a sage thrasher. There aren't that many places in California you can see a sage thrasher. The Sierra Valley Preserve is, um, is a great place to see them, especially on the Madalena side and, and, on, and on the west side too, the new entrance that's opening shortly. Uh, just, just look for the mature sage and you're likely to find one of these. Two other sage loving species on the Sierra Valley Preserve are the Brewer Sparrow on the left, Vesper Sparrow on the right. This is relative size, Vesper Sparrow with a bold eye ring, not so much with the Brewer Sparrow, streaking and a chestnut shoulder patch on the, on the Vesper. So here's a, a map of the Sierra Valley Preserve. Um, you can access it coming from Reno on Highway 70. And then it has both uh, Eastern and Western entrances now. The West entrance is gonna be here. It's opening very imminently, uh, I think in late April. Um, so go and check it out. It's got a, a nice loop trail on the East and there are a series of trails that aren't shown in this map on the left, uh, on the West side too. So lots of, uh, lots of great birding opportunities. And then I did want to, a lot, some of you in the, um, questions asked about, um, I'll just do this really quick here. A couple of you asked about like where the um, steel bridge, uh, where Mar Marble Hot Springs Road is. So I just wanna um, take you 
a lot of you live, I saw a lot of you like live either in Sacramento or in the Bay Area. So basically what you wanna do, you turn at Truckee on 89, come north to Sierraville, take a, a left on 89, and you get to Satley, you turn on to uh, A23 or 640, it's a county road, follow it north about 10 miles. And you come to right here, Marble Hot Springs Road, which is like I say, one of the most famous birding roads in the Sierra Nevada. The steel bridge is here marked on the road. Um, and you can see all the species I just mentioned. And then a great loop after you go across the Marble Hot Springs Road, it's good to get out at the wetland crossings and walk across the bridges and then, uh, and then curl around here to Harriet Lane and head south. Harriet Lane also takes you through a cross section of the wetlands. And you can follow Harriet Lane back to Highway 49 and then Loop 49 back to Sierraville and have a margarita and some great Mexican food at Los Dos Hermanos for a great birding loop. And you can hit the Sierra Valley Preserve while you're at it too. Okay. Um, I know I got a motor, I'm getting behind here. So there's the, there's what the steel bridge looks like for those of you who haven't been to it, very popular birding area. This was on one of our tours. Um, you can really get a feel for how Sierra Valley is a Lake Tahoe sized valley. Uh, and now we're on to Lake Almanor Chester, Lake Almanor Chester. Um, so in terms of Lake Al, this shows, uh, this slide oh. is of, oh, go ahead. Did you wanna answer a question or two about Sierra Valley before we move on? Uh, sure, probably just one given okay. that I'm kind of running behind, but yes, oh. that sounds good. Okay, so um, Suzanne would like to know where do redheads breed in Sierra Valley? Good question. Um, they, they, we have documented them breeding on the Sierra Valley Preserve. Uh, it has, they're generally a deep water fish eating duck species, a diving duck. So they, they require more open water and deep water than most ducks in Sierra Valley. So the Sierra Valley Preserve is a good spot. Um, the Roberti Ranch, if you know the Robertis, and then, um, and then uh, steel, you can find them in the, the, if you're coming from the west to the east on Marble Hot Springs Road, the first couple channels you cross, the, the very, the westernmost wetland channel, which isn't the steel bridge, but just has a bridge, they often nest just north of that first bridge. Great. So, there okay. And um, there are some more questions, but we'll, we'll come back to them at the end. Hopefully we'll have some time. Yeah. Then. I know it's kind of like there's so many, you know, I know one, there's some good questions here, but carry on and we'll come yeah, back. It's one of the, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's like, we could, we could definitely go two hours. If we were in the field, we'd have all day. We'd have eight hours. Um, <laughs> so uh, in terms of, we're also going to look at Lake Almanor and Chester Meadow. This is a slide of the, the Feather River Land Trust Olson Barn Meadow property, which includes the very prominent 150 year old Olson Barn there in the slide. Some of the highlights of Lake Almanor and Chester Meadow is that it has a unique gallery cottonwood willow riparian forest. Gallery means it has really tall cottonwoods that form an almost complete canopy along the North Fork. Uh, it has one of the Sierra Cascades last remaining strongholds of the endangered willow flycatcher, which we'll see some slides of. It has the densest breeding, uh, the densest documented breeding concentrations of yellow warblers in the whole Sierra. Point Blue has documented that and globally significant Western and Clark's Gree breeding colonies in Lake Almanor itself, which have been increasingly um, having challenges with the uh, variable lake levels during their breeding season, unfortunately, as the lake is, as the lake levels drop to, um, to satisfy California power supply and things by PG&E. And then there's just an amazing diversity of waterfowl, shorebirds, raptors, and other species as well. Um, here we're looking at the Lake Almanor region, um, Highway 36 coming through Chester, where we're focused on is right along the river, which is the, uh, you see my cursor there, that's where the Olson Barn Meadow property is. And then the causeway crossing uh, this northern uh, most arm of Lake Almanor into Last Chance uh, Marsh up to the north there. So that's where we're gonna focus on. Um, it's an amazing, Lake Almanor is a, a, as diverse as Sierra Valley for the, some of the same reasons. It's literally right at the junction of the Sierra and Cascade, uh, and it has Great Basin and, and Modoc Plateau influence from the northeast and east. 
um, and you know volcanic and granitic geology coming together. Has amazing wet meadows like this on the on the Olson Barn property. Uh, a really high quality gallery riparian, as you see here along the North Fork. Uh, just a variety of habitats, all in close proximity. This is on the edge, on various edges of the Almanor shore. Um, and there, and big water, you know, big, big lake habitat for aquatic species like grebes and diving ducks and, and pelicans and such. Uh, here's another shot of just a magnificently beautiful Lake Almanor. And a lot of mixed conifer forest you see there on the edge too. So some of the bird highlights, um, these, I think these, this is a brother and sister that are just enjoying the bridge that is just uh, along the old um, Collins Pine Railroad, just off the Olson Barn property. And uh, a lovely place to just take in a quiet moment, bird, go swimming in the, in the river, go fishing, uh, magnificent place. So yeah, yellow, I mentioned yellow warblers, the densest concentration of breeding yellow warblers in the Sierra. Those cottonwoods, they're just packed in those cottonwoods and willows along that last couple miles of river of the North Fork before it goes into Lake Almanor, which includes the southern edge of the Olson Barn property, Feather River Land Trust property. Here's the endangered, um, sorry, I'm not stop, I'm not doing my four second pause because of our time. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should, maybe I'll give you like a two second pause. This species is endangered, it likes willows. It is the endangered willow flycatcher, and um, there are uh, estimated to be, sadly, uh, only 150 to 200 uh, uh, pairs of this species remaining breeding in the Sierra. And the between Warner Valley, which is up towards Drakesbad um, on uh, Lassen National Park on the way, and Chester Meadow, um, there at least um, half of that total lives in, in the combination of Chester Meadow and Warner Valley. And then there's several pairs in uh, Tasman Coyom, Humbug Valley as well. So very important for, for this endangered species. Man, the, the cottonwoods along the North Fork um, on Olson Barn property and downstream, which is all PG&E land going all the way down to the lake, is, is utterly packed with this species. They love cavities and trees. They're a cavity nesting species, a swallow. And it is tree swallow. These are male tree swallows. Another really common species along the riparian corridor along the North Fork is this vireo. It has a uh, kind of a, uh, it goes deedly 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 dee, deedly 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 do, deedly just over and over. Um, and it is the warbling vireo, very common, almost as common as the yellow warbler. In the Chester Meadow, a lot that we have sandhill cranes, as I mentioned, the, the Feather River region is really important for the state threatened sandhill crane. And, uh, and uh, the Olson Barn Meadow is a great place. There's usually one or two pairs on Olson Barn Meadow and um, on the pg &E side, uh, which is towards the lake from Olson Barn Meadow. Uh, our red-winged blackbird, male, is, is, uh, loves it there too. Uh, the, a lake the size of Lake Almanor with the abundant fishery that it has, along with the abundant fishery in the North Fork Feather, really attract a lot of fish-eating birds of various sorts, um, including raptors. And this one uh, has Velcro on its feet, specialized in catching, feet, uh, catching fish with its feet and its strong talons diving from high heights, diving head first, but at the last minute they put their feet down first and it is an osprey. And then there's a lot, so there's lots of breeding ospreys all around Lake Almanor. Like uh, probably, I can't remember the last Forest Service estimate, like 15 pairs or something. And, uh, and there's also a lot of breeding, our, our national symbol, the adult on the left and an immature. It takes five years for these immature eagles to get into that classic white head, white tail of the adult and it's the bald eagle. The Olson barn itself is often host to owls, although there's some concern that this species hasn't been seen in the last year and a half or so, which is concerning us. I, I'm kind of tending to recommend maybe the land trust should put a nest box in there because the great horned owls sometimes kick these guys out, um, but this is a barn owl 
in the Olson barn. Very, one of the most beautiful owl species with its real bright white. And then, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, fish eating birds in general, including our, our American white pelicans. These are non breeding young ones. This one especially has a lot of gray on it, kind of a first year bird, probably coming over from Pyramid. And there are also our ibis, you know, our white faced ibis. This is different than the ones we saw, uh, the slides I showed in Sierra Valley, though. Um, this is a young of the year, an immature white faced ibis. It doesn't have uh, nearly the sort of red tones or white tones on its face, a lot more washed out neck and head generally, without as much coppery and, um, and um, sort of greenish peacock kind of color. Um, but still really beautiful. They're really common in the in the midsummer and late summer around the Lake Elmanor shore. Great place to see white-faced ibis. A lot of them breed up at the nearby uh, Mountain Meadows Reservoir. And then, as I mentioned, um, Lake Elmanor itself is home to a globally important population of grebes and those grebes are the Western grebe, which is shown here. Um, this is, uh, and this is a pair. They have a really distinctive and beautiful uh, mating ritual where they run side by side um, along the water. And uh, that's how they, they decide who they're gonna pair up with. And uh, beautiful species. Unfortunately, the lake, uh, the lake levels at Almanor are challenging the um, ability to successfully manage the water levels of the grebes. A lot of times they'll build a floating nest and the water level will go down and suddenly their nests are high and dry. And there's been a lot of nest failures the last two or three years, unfortunately. But yeah, because there's been breeding colonies um, in the thousands in some of the better years, uh, but the, the, the size of the colony seems to be decreasing because of all the nest failures, unfortunately. And this is, uh, there's, Acmorphous, a acmorph. A a I, I should have written it down. Acmorphous is the genus. This is Clark's grebe, which is very closely related, same genus as the Western grebe. You can see with the Clark's grebe here that um, the crown, the black crown and eyebrow, is over the top of the red eye. And here with the Western grebe, the, the red eye is in, is enveloped by the black crown and eyebrow. And there's also, you can usually pick up on bill coloration. The Western Grebe has a more olive-ish, greenish tones in the bill, whereas the Clark's Grebe has more sort of orangish and yellowish tones without a green tone. And then they both, it's so cute, they both often carry their newly hatched young around on their backs and feed them. Like what a great scenario to be a young Grebe with your mama getting fed on her back. Um, let's see, we're getting... We're getting close here. So just a couple slides to orient you around um, where, where I'm talking about. This is the town of Chester here. And this shows the Olson Barn Meadow property. Um, there's, a great, uh, there, there's a great footpath to the barn itself, which is just an architectural marvel. It's like four or five stories high, 150 years old. A Norwegian barn builder built it. You've got to check it out if you haven't seen it. It's just really inspiring and amazing. And then, and the land trust has restored and, and um, stabilized it. And then there's a footpath that goes right along the river here into some of this really choice cottonwood willow riparian. And then you can loop back on the old Collins Railroad line, which is going to be Im uh, improved more and more as a trail. Um, you'll hear more about that down the line, and you can loop back to the parking area. These wetlands in the north part of this property, a, a willow flycatchers hang out up here. So if you want to uh, get some fly catchers, take this northern footpath. There's a great parking lot right off, uh, great, great parking lot right off Highway 36. And then uh, lastly, let's see, I already kind of pointed out the causeway. Um, I know it's kind of a little bit hard to see here. I'll just briefly zoom in. Um, again, here's Chester. This is the Olson Barn Meadow property. And all this dark green is PG&E land, which the land trust now, and, and Maidu. Um, fortunately, the Maidu Summit Consortium has acquired some of these lands up in the Last Chance Marsh area. So it's a combination of PG&E and, um, and Maidu land now. Um, but this, the causeway is this, um, it's, a, it's essentially a bridge with, with culverts that go under 
under the highway. But there's, you have to be careful because sometimes the traffic's moving pretty fast across here, but there are pullouts because there's an old rail, the, the railroad goes across and you can just find wide spots. Get out your scope and scope uh, north is, north either way is really good, north and south for um, a wide variety of species, including the ones that I showed in the slide. So um, I think we're nearing, let me uh, just have a couple remaining slides here. Um, I did want to again acknowledge, even though this, uh, this slide is of Tasman Koyom, Humbug Valley, again, wanted to acknowledge that we're uh, talking about and working in the homeland of the Maidu people. And, um, and yeah, really excited about um, the conservation work of the land trust. It's a blessing to be working in this, in such a beautiful region as the, as the Feather River watershed. I am really, really thankful um, again for um, my partnership with so many of you, my friendship with so many of you. I really, really want to get out in the field with you. Uh, it may have to wait, unfortunately, till next season it looks like, but, um, but just thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for being part of this journey and for loving the Feather River region and the species that live within it and for caring about its conservation and the future of this region that we all love. So with that, I will pass it on to Katie, who's been monitoring uh, the chat and the questions and um, close with some questions here. Thank all right. You. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, so one of the, here's a real quick question I'll start with. Um, what is the water bird with the big booming call? This came ah. up when you were in Sierra Valley. Yes, I was, I was, that's one I was going to do, but then I saw I was so far behind on time. It, I showed a slide of it. They often get in this pose where they try to make like a cattail or a reed, but you can often identify them by their voice like so many different bird species. This one's particularly booming. It goes like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds really deep, like a grouse. There's only a couple species that make that deep of a sound, and the blue grouse would be another. And it is the American bittern. Um, good, good auditory observation. <laughs> Great. Um, so, and here's a bigger question. Um, Tommy would like to know what effects of climate change we're seeing on bird populations in Sierra Valley. Ah. Good, good question. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, it, it, we're in the early stages of, of seeing what, how that's going to really unfold. The, in some ways, the projections are more concerning in terms of both total precipitation and snowpack in the eastern part of the Feather River watershed, which would include Sierra Valley. Interestingly, on the west side, a lot of the projections are for uh, less snowpack, but as much or more precipitation. So um, Sierra Valley is so big, it, do, it, does, it does get some of the snowpack and, and precip from some of the Sierra crest, you know, so it's, and then, and then it's also interesting, a lot of it's like a managed wetland, you know, there's a lot of ranch irrigation and, and dams and things that can hold water in Sierra Valley. But overall, it's, it's a concerning trend. Um, fortunately, the Feather River Land Trust on its Sierra Valley Preserve has good water rights in a couple, in one, one really large dam um, and, and, and a couple other uh, diversion structures where they can hold water later into the breeding season. Because basically, one of the upshots is things, uh, if, if, if there isn't some kind of intervention Things are going to dry out faster and it's often unfortunately going to be during the kind of post-fledging period and, and ducks have this eclipse period where they they go through a molt in the summer and they can't fly during that time so they're really susceptible if water levels go down rapidly in the mid to late summer both the young of the year and the adults that are molting um, can be really susceptible to predators so anyhow it, it, the Feather River Land Trust and, and some of the ranchers as well that we have easements on are going to be able to hold water longer into the season, keep the water levels higher. But, um, but in terms of natural flow regime, it's a, it's a very concerning trend. Um, the, 
Almanor Basin looks better from a, like a rainfall snowpack perspective and it has a lot of spring systems, groundwater kind of spring systems that, so it looks more resilient in the face of climate change. A lot of the climate mapping reflects that as well. That's, that's kind of the overall take on things. Thank you. Um, Corey, do you, do we want to take one more question or do you feel we should wrap it up? Yeah, I think um, there were quite a few questions about canoeing and kayaking in the Sierra Valley, kind of best locations. I don't know, Paul, if you have any more recent intel, but I heard today from Christy that the water isn't great right now. Um, yeah. Do you have any insights on that? That's, that's what I've heard too. I actually haven't been out there um, in the last like month or two. Um, but yeah, Christy has showed, sent me some photos and it doesn't look very good this year um, unless, unless we get a lot of rain in April. You know, usually a lot of the, a lot of the best canoeing is kind of uh, April through early June. Uh, it's a good combination of decent water levels and that's when a lot of the species have arrived um so yeah the forecast is not good i would i would recommend you can either uh, contact me my contact information will be at the last slide or contact the feather river land trust office um best places to put in when the water is sufficient is uh, the steel bridge uh, there's actually it's a county road so there's a county right of way the uh, former rancher and the current rancher have these like setback fences that are made of metal where you can actually maneuver in there, get a canoe or kayaks in there and go down or upstream. Uh, it's federally navigable waters. So you can, uh, once you're in, you can uh, go up and down. Uh, you can, one way you can go down to the Madalena um, uh, bird platform on the, on the wet, on the east side of the um, Bed River Land Trust Sierra Valley Preserve. Another really good place to put in is the um, A23 bridge um, just south of Beckworth. Uh, you, you turn south on A23 off of Highway 70, just go about a quarter mile and you can, and there's a road that goes under that bridge. You can put in there and go upstream uh, on the river and then into the northern part of the Sierra Valley Preserve. I will say that the, the Feather River Land Trust is finalizing its canoe um, guidelines there are sensitivities, especially in low water years to canoeing. It's a pretty narrow wetland. So in low water years, right in the middle of the breeding season, it can disturb uh, key nesting bird species like sandhill cranes and such. So it's likely that it, the land trust is going to, when they open the preserve here in a couple of weeks, go to kind of a, a guided, I think they're gonna do guided tours only in May and June. And then we'll probably have it open generally um, in April or earlier, and then open kind of like in, uh, you know, from July onward. There's, there's a pretty good fall canoe season too. Um, once the ranchers have to take their boards off of the irrigation structures, you, you can email me for, there's a lot of, there's a lot of particulars about like where to put in. Um, but yeah, it is, it is federal. It's sort of tricky that like the land trust, is going to request that people not canoe during those times in the interest of bird conservation. And although it is, you know, open navigable waters of the US kind of a situation. But anyway, email me for details. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Paul. We're, we're at the end of our hour here. Um, so just wanted to, you know, thank you again. As you said, normally we love to invite you all out on the land to join us for these events in person, but you did such a nice job, Paul, just bringing these places and all of this wildlife to life for us tonight. Um, I'm excited to get out. I hope everybody else has been inspired to get your binoculars and your books and get outside. Um, we do hope to bring you more events like this in the future. Um, we are currently kind of only doing virtual events right now, but we do hope to have some smaller in-person events when we are able to do so safely. So please stay tuned for that. Um, I'm gonna post in the chat just uh, some links that you can check out. Um, we'd love to have you sign up for our e-news if you wanna stay up to date on the news of the land trust, um, our conservation work throughout the region, opportunities to get involved and updates on upcoming events like this. 
you can visit our website to do that. I'll, oh, we've got it here on the screen for you, and I'll also post it in the chat. Um, and finally, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight, and especially to our Land Trust members who are on the call. Um, as Katie and Paul both said, you know, we are a local nonprofit um, that all of the work that we do, including bringing you events like this, is only possible because of the support of our members. So, and, and all the work we do to preserve these habitats and create these preserves and open places for people to visit is through your support. So thanks again to all of our members. And if you're not yet a member of the Land Trust, we'd love to have you join us. Um, and you can also do so online. So I'm gonna just go ahead and um, post those links in the chat. Um, if you'd like to check out more information about our work, please do visit our website. And you're always also free to reach out to any of us. And I'm sorry, I don't think I actually introduced myself to those of you that I don't know, but I'm Corey Pargy. I also work at the Land Trust and am the development director. Um, so our contacts are here on the screen. If you wanna reach out with any final questions um, about the presentation tonight or about our work in general, please do. Um, we will be making this recording available. We'll be posting it on our website in the next few days. And we'll also um, send out a follow-up to those of you who, who registered uh, so that you can watch it later and check out all those slides and take your notes on, on the unique species to check out. So thanks again, everybody. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all the questions tonight. Um, but again, feel free to reach out to us. And thanks for joining. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank Hope you, to be in the field soon. It's better out there. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone.